In June 1554, Richard left England to seek help and sanctuary for us in Europe. That winter was bitterly cold and lonely. My baby girl and I waited to hear if Richard had been successful in his plight. Eventually, news reached us that he had. On New Year's Day 1555, between four and five in the morning, I emerged into the freezing darkness dressed as a merchant's wife and carrying little Susan in my arms. Accompanying me were six of my most trusted servants. The rest of my household had no idea that we planned to escape Catholic England. Our escape, however, was not easy. Three times we set sail, and twice we were blown back to England, until finally on our third attempt we were successful. Having finally landed in Brabant, me, my daughter's governess and my laundress were all dressed like women of the Netherlands and we continued our journey towards the Duchy of Cleves. We hoped to find a more permanent home in Wessel, some 11 miles away, where a minister named Francis Perusel, who I had helped in England many years ago, resided. We travelled on foot with only two servants. The rain was heavy and constant, and all around us there was frost and ice. My child, in need of warmth, shelter and sustenance, cried pitifully, as did I. Once in Vessel, we could find no shelter, and no one could tell us where Perusal's house was. We continued searching for many hours, until finally, as luck would have it, Richard knocked on one door, and Francis Perusal answered it. With tears of joy and relief, we entered the house where we were finally able to change our sodden clothes and eat a good meal. In a few days, we obtained permission to settle in the town and rented a very fair house. It was here I was able to tell my husband that I was pregnant once more. The birth of our son on the 14th of October was a joyful occasion, but mixed with sadness as we learnt of more burnings of Protestants in England, including the execution of my old friend and chaplain, Hugh Latimer. Whilst in exile, we were forced to move from place to place to keep our whereabouts unknown. The Queen's ambassadors visited Europe regularly, and we received several letters demanding our immediate return to England. From Vessel, we moved to Weinheim. Then we headed towards Poland, where we were entertained by the king. The king of Poland held us in high regard and saw us settled comfortably in what you now call Lithuania. It was here we intended to stay until it was safe to return to England, which happened far more quickly than we had anticipated. In late November 1558, news reached us of the death of Queen Mary. Our hearts were filled with joy and hope as her Protestant sister ascended the throne. My four years in exile had taxed my endurance and my faith, but I had never faltered in my beliefs. I immediately started corresponding with Elizabeth. At New Year, I ensured a richly embroidered cushion set with pearls was sent to her, and in January 1559, I composed a long letter congratulating her on her ascension. If I could have left for England immediately, I would have done. But my husband and I had assumed responsibilities in the Polish lands, and we could not abandon our benefactors. We also needed to plan our journey home, a journey of hundreds of miles and with two small children. In the spring of 1559, we finally returned to our beloved England and quickly re-established ourselves at Grimsthorpe. All our lands and goods were restored to us, and our debts to the crown were cancelled. I cannot express how much joy and relief I felt as we settled back into our country and home in the company of around a hundred servants. I had hoped my twilight years would be peaceful, but alas, this was not meant to be. My stepdaughter and childhood friend Frances Grey died in late 1559, her eldest surviving daughter, Catherine, who served in the Queen's Privy Chamber, married in secret 
and were sent to the Tower of London. Then the young lovers were sent to separate aristocratic houses, never to see each other again. A few years later, in 1565, I learned that her younger sister Mary had also contracted a secret marriage. Once again, the lovers were separated. Her husband was sent to Fleet Prison, whilst Mary was sent to live with me for almost two years. And once again, I was not given any help in providing for her. Indeed, my own son Peregrine's choice of wife alarmed me. Having been briefly linked with Bess of Hardwick's daughter, Elizabeth Cavendish, it was arranged that Peregrine should wed Mary de Vere, the Earl of Oxford's sister. I knew too much about the Earl of Oxford's dealings to be pleased with the match, and Oxford disliked us just as much. However, the Queen gave her consent, and we were obliged to accept her decision. After their marriage, they moved into Grimsthorpe, whilst Richard and I took a house in Hampstead. Peregrine's marriage was an unhappy one. The young couple began to drink heavily, and I had to watch as Grimsthorpe was neglected. There were, of course, some joyful moments in those last few years, too. Richard and I were always regarded highly by those around us. We often visited other noble families and were frequently invited to participate in christenings and weddings. Richard settled back into the life of a country gentleman and was elected one of two members of Parliament for Lincolnshire. He sat in the Commons for four years. In late 1570, our daughter Susan married Reginald Grey, heir to the Earldom of Kent, and the man of her choice. During the last years of my life, I established godly households at my principal residences in London and Lincolnshire. I appointed reformers as my chaplains, employed Protestant ministers as preachers, bought Bibles and other devotional literature for my dependents, offered financial help to those who shared my beliefs, and used my influence to promote the Protestant faith. My life was long, and although it was peppered with danger and sadness, I must always remember how lucky I was. I survived a fever, smallpox, and the births of four children, including three sons. I was married to the best friend of a king, a man who respected and admired me, and after his death I was able to marry again for love. I entertained the King of England in his darkest hour, served five of his queens and lived to tell their tales. I survived the persecution of Protestants under Queen Mary, exile, and raised two healthy children. However, no one can live forever, and eventually on the 19th of September 1580, I died. After I died, I was remembered in literature. Our sufferings were recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. My life was the basis of Thomas Drew's play The Life of the Duchess of Suffolk, published in 1624, and of Thomas Deloney's Ballad, The Most Rare and Excellent History of the Duchess of Suffolk's Calamity. I would, if I may, like to end my story with Deloney's concluding stanza. For when Queen Mary was deceased... The Duchess home returned again, who was by sorrow quite released. By Queen Elizabeth's happy reign, whose godly life and piety we may praise continually. <laughs>